Last weekend, Netflix released season two of their hit series, Stranger Things, just in time for Halloween. The show, of course, was an instant cult classic, creating millions of fans last year with its clever combination of an original sci-fi slash horror plotline with engaging and well-developed characters and a heavy dose of 80s nostalgia. But just how original are the concepts and themes of this mega-hit series? How much of it all is actually limited to the realm of science fiction and fantasy in the first place? The channel ODD TV made an excellent video in 2016 explaining how the facility featured in Stranger Things where the children were experimented on using trauma-based mind control techniques and sensory deprivation chambers is a surprisingly accurate depiction of what really did occur under the Montauk Project. The Montauk Project. The Montauk Project was a series of secret United States government projects conducted at Camp Hero and or Montauk Air Force Station on Montauk, Long Island. It was secretly developing a powerful psychological war weapon. The Montauk Project is a continuation of the controversial Philadelphia experiment, which took place around October 28, 1943. A report was prepared and presented to Congress and was soundly rejected as far too dangerous. So a proposal was made directly to the Department of Defense promising a powerful new weapon that can drive an enemy insane, inducing the symptoms of schizophrenia at the touch of a button. Without congressional approval, the project would have to be top secret and secretly funded. The Department of Defense approved. The U.S. Air Force had a decommissioned base at Montauk, New York, not far from Brookhaven, which had a complete SAGE radar installation. This site was large and remote, and water access would allow equipment to be moved in and out undetected. Uh, one thing they loved to do was uh, drown you, hold you underwater to the point where you were about to give up. They wanted to split the mind. They wanted to shatter the mind. Then they would program each individual piece for something else. But what was the intention on the beatings and the drownings? That must have that, been... That was to shatter the uh, mind even further. So they can manipulate it? Yes, they can manipulate it. Breaking the psyche of the person uh, to install programming, to fracture the mind pattern, is to make you uncomfortable. Because when you're, you know, first you're cold, then you're hot, then you're cold, and you, the mind doesn't know what to expect. And after a while, it fractures. Okay, when you take a personality and you fragment it into pieces, they take one of the pieces and then they develop it into a sub-personality or a related personality, which is a little different than the core personality. And then they provide a code that triggers that personality to come forward and take control of the body. There were so many different types of rituals that involved astral entities uh, but uh, one of them was to create the child as a vessel so that the entity could enter the body of the child and animate it and then those participating in the ritual would achieve uh, the energy of that entity that was occupying the body. There would be a chemical type of smell. It would put things in my arms, in my legs, in my genitals, in my head and then I would hear input voices over and over and over again and then there'd be like this swirl I would see the swirling uh, vortex over my uh, visual uh, perception Researcher William Ramsey did a short video pointing out some of the symbolism there relating to occult numerology and connections to the West Memphis Three and Damien Eccles, who is a follower of the Crowleyan religion. Eleven. What's that mean? What's it mean? You find out later that her last name is Ives, I-V-E-S, which really means nothing until you find out another of the main character's names is Byers, the same last name 
as one of the victims in the West Memphis Three murders in Arkansas. In 1987, teenagers Kevin Ives and Don Henry were found dead on a railroad track in the forest of Arkansas. Initially, the death of Ives and his friend was ruled accidental, but a few months later, the ruling was changed to probable homicide. The creators of the show seem to use the same type of imagery from the West Memphis Three murders. Winona Ryder stars as the mother of the missing child. She was also a supporter of the West Memphis Three. Here she is with Los Angeles supporters. This is Winona Ryder with Dan Stidham, the defense attorney who represented Jesse Miss Kelly. I got it! Does the seven count? It was the seven? Did Mike see it? Then it doesn't count. Gons Shimura of the Face Like the Sun channel did a fantastic job delving into a lot of the spiritual and occult symbolism found in the series as well as talking about many of the implications the story has regarding things like interdimensional contact between our plane of existence and the demonic realm. Quote, I believe this show is popular at a surface level because of its many 80s pop culture references and a glimpse into what life was like as a preteen kid before the world of the internet, right? It's just totally different and it appeals to that nostalgia that I've said before, people like us born in the 80s were the last generation to live before the world of the internet, which goes to show how huge the internet is in terms of its vehicle to promote certain concepts and ideas like it does here on Stranger Things. But the show's richness in the plot and the characters and the outright references to fringe subject matters really gives Stranger Things a depth that very few shows have achieved. But even behind all that richness and great plot and all that stuff is this really deep well of occult symbolism throughout the show connections to pagan mythologies and deities, to the obvious references to Spielberg in the 80s style cinema, which beyond just a nostalgia thing, I think is an homage to the people in the era who really did define how to captivate an audience with a story that delivers occulted realities, to the revealing of the kinds of outcomes that resulted from mind control experiments with children like MK Ultra. It appeals to the idea of human psychology and imagination in connection to the unseen world as it bleeds into our world. It touches on the quantum anomalies that create portals and gateways into this unseen underworld. The obvious tip to the realities of electromagnetism having a huge part of this construct of how these portals and dimensions work with each other, and even the messianic symbolism laid right in front of us with one of the most important characters of the show, Eleven, which they call El, again, reference to God in Hebrew, or divine being in Hebrew, who recalls of the torturous experiments conducted on her in the MK Ultra program and defeats the demigorgon or this demonic entity in the show by sacrificing herself. And so the show is jam-packed with these references, and there's no way I'm going to be able to touch on every single one of those references. It's just too rich. And I don't know if all of the references here were intentional or not, but it definitely has struck a chord with a lot of people, and it's become a phenomenon, which in itself says something about where we are in society. Now, on this YouTube channel, we've talked a lot about the bleed-through between the Unseen World and this world, you know, the spiritual dimension with this physical dimension and, you know, how it's been happening and how the effects have been documented in many different ways from paranormal events to now digital events and the crossover there with a lot of the devices now that capture disembodied voices and things like that and the many videos and photos we've seen of alleged paranormal events, some of it fake, some of it unexplained. There is a undergirding reality to this idea of openings into the other side or the other world, what the show Stranger Things calls the upside down. And it's a theme that's been shown to us throughout media. And it comes in the form of this black darkness, this deep 
and really this black goo. Now I made two short videos on black goo and there are others like Nicholson1968 who have done great videos that talk about the black goo, but there's definitely this connection to technology and this black goo. We see it in the symbolism in the Lady Gaga stuff who obviously promotes this virtual reality. KJ mentioned, and I had the exact same thought when I was watching it, the scene from Under the Skin where they're in this dimension of black glass that becomes goo, this substance. And if you have the eyes to see it, it's really everywhere. You see it all over the place. And this idea of a screen and this connection to technology is deeper than I think people realize. Is there a connection with all this deliberately to the monolith that was shown in Space Odyssey 2001? Is that the beginning of this opening of a portal or this ascension this advancement, this occult promise that is actually a fulfillment of biblical prophecy which leads to God's judgment and the restoration of all creation. Are we seeing these elements being presented to us for a reason? And I think we have to step back and take a look at where we're at here because the internet, which Netflix is built on the internet, right? Stranger Things is a show that's being exclusively delivered on the internet. Really the internet is an opening into alternative realities and our devices are just windows into all these different realms. Some of them real and you know edited and presented to you. Some of them not real, the world of fantasy or virtual reality or different stories, TV shows, science fiction. We've become a society that conceptually interacts with this non-corporal metaphysical side of life. The realm of imagination, you know, we call it data or information that's gathered and presented in this medium, but that's the whole point. These ideas, these realms, these virtual worlds require a physical medium to access it. And I think the all-seeing eye symbolism has been one that's represented throughout the occult world, a representation of a window into this unseen world or this occult underworld, the realm of the imagination that's actually bleeding into our world. And that commentary is really interesting because I believe this is a reality. I believe there is something to human consciousness and human imagination that has a direct relationship with the spiritual world and directly affects our physical world. It is indeed extremely fascinating to look back on it all, and that section of Gonza's video specifically, and to reflect on that in light of much of the research I've been doing on my own channel involving enclosed cosmology, and the idea of overlapping spiritual dimensions, and the quantum physics arena, and its relationship to occult concepts and ideology. But speaking of occult ideology, that's really the reason I felt led to chime in on this topic now with Season 2, especially in light of another Halloween and how all this ties together as yet another piece of the massive tapestry of mainstream propaganda that is, without question, pushing this Luciferian occult ideology in rather obvious ways, if only you're willing to admit it. While many, many people out there have been pointing out the facts surrounding the reality of things like the MKUltra programs and the connections to Project Paperclip and Montauk and so many of the black budget programs that have gone on and are still going on, uh, which involve the weaponization and industrialization of ancient occult practices, witchcraft, and satanic ritual abuse. Uh, the one aspect that's probably not emphasized nearly enough within this peculiar circle of, you know, truther media evaluation is the simple underlying message pervading the entire series in, in both seasons, and probably all that might come in the future. And it's this message of how the protagonists face off against this mysterious and terrifying combination of covert government agendas and these nightmarish supernatural entities from some dark dimension. The thematic visuals that dominated the trailers and the artwork for the series too really encapsulates it all perfectly. The four boys of this group of friends, finally reunited after Will was missing for pretty much the entirety of season one, uh, they get dressed up for Halloween as the Ghostbusters. And this is more than just more 80s nostalgia. This is basically the epitome of the whole show. 
And it's actually kind of a perfect way of stopping and reflecting on the fact that, in many ways, the 1980s, which is a decade that I lived through as a child myself, I, it was a time when this theme of the supernatural and horror, aliens, poltergeists, all of it just really exploded in movies and pop culture, along with, you know, there was always the average Joe heroes who were always so common in the 80s material who who would rise up to stand against, you know, whatever out-of-this-world threat was, was coming at them. Both series 1 and 2 of Stranger Things utilizes the game Dungeons & Dragons as a sort of plot device through which the boys use various characters and elements from the quote fantasy game to help explain various features and phenomenon they are encountering in the real world. Yet, ironically, this is precisely what Dungeons & Dragons was designed to do in the real world, as it introduces a wide variety of concepts to the players that are straight out of the arena of witchcraft and the occult. And what's more, this is also exactly what all those movies from the 80s like Ghostbusters, Gremlins, Aliens, E.T., It, The Shining, so on and so forth, that's what they were all doing as well. And that's what Stranger Things is continuing to do. Right now. The entire horror movie genre is itself a form of trauma-based mind control being disseminated to the public at large. The thousands of poor innocent children who were, and, and still are undoubtedly, victims of satanic ritual abuse and various Montauk-related experiments over the years, they had no choice in the matter. Yet millions upon millions of people out there are now willingly exposing themselves to horrific imagery, violence, rape, paranormal apparitions, and monsters, and all the rest, all in the name of entertainment. So people now actually pay to be subjected to, quote, low-level forms of trauma, ostensibly for the alleged cathartic effect. Cathartic in the sense that it's the, the whole notion of watching something in order to try and, you know, not be scared by it, to see if you can endure the, the carnage or the suspense or whatever, and in short, to become desensitized. Season 2 of Stranger Things adds the introduction of another survivor from the facility named Kali, which is yet more obvious symbolism, especially when you place that alongside the name L for Eleven, since both those names are associated with the names of deities. And Kali teaches L to use her power more effectively to control and channel her inner turmoil and emotional pain from the trauma and abuse and use it to her advantage. So there are several layers of messaging going on there. On a more generic level, it's the message of, you know, emotional healing and personal growth essentially being a self-guided and self-accomplished process. Dealing with the past, uh, painful memories, relational hurts, internal psychological and, and developmental obstacles, all this, you know, overcoming that by way of mastering those internal issues on your own, maybe with someone else's help, but something that you piece back together yourself without the need for things like forgiveness or redemption from a higher power. In short, it's the message that you don't need some external God to experience healing and wholeness in your life. At the same time, there's also the very pronounced message of glorifying the occult powers that L received as a result of her time spent in the horrors of the secret program. So even though the process by which she was enhanced in that way was evil, the powers themselves are not considered evil, they just can be used against evil, and that's the real key. Her powers are actually ultimately portrayed as the only thing that's capable of saving uh, herself, saving her friends, and even the town as a whole, from the interdimensional demonic threat. That's extremely, extremely important, because this is where the deceptive nature of the message is at its most subtle and yet most significant. Not surprisingly, it's really the same message, the same sort of plot that we who grew up in those nostalgic 80s, we saw over and over and over again. And now we see them being constantly rehashed and re-released for the younger generations, not just in the throwbacks and culture nods of Stranger Things, but, but even in things like the new Ghostbusters movie with the female cast. And they just did a remake of Stephen King's It, where, you know, just like in The Goonies and Stand By Me and the E.T. and all those motifs, 
the group of nerdy kids bands together and faces the danger together as a team. And so, you know, in this familiar Spielberg-esque treatment of magic and sci-fi that so many of us grew up with, it's really the same thing over and over again. It's the same with Lucas and Star Wars, which, you know, coincidentally is still going stronger than ever, still glamorizing the same telekinetic powers of the Force that we see L use in Stranger Things. The craziest thing about the Netflix series to me is how it blatantly portrays the crossover of concepts from magic and witchcraft, as pulled from the D&D references, into the quote, scientific manifestations of those same creatures and dimensions in the real world. And in that way, it's, it's like the perfect snapshot. Of, it's a very helpful analogy, I'd say. Not just for the rampant expansion of such occult propaganda in the 80s, but really the entire 20th century as a whole could be understood in that way. It really would not be stepping out of bounds to go so far as to say that this is essentially the entire purpose of science fiction across the board. It, what it boils down to is the introduction and normalization of concepts and themes and ideologies to the public at large that, for most of human history, were limited to the pages of rare necronomicons and closely guarded Kabbalistic texts and outlawed scrolls full of spells and invocations and rituals. One of the most ubiquitous tenets of occult thinking throughout all of history has been the belief that the spiritual realms are inhabited by both good and evil entities, and all sorts of species and races and such, and that it is within the capability of the adept, of the, the sorcerer, if you will, to not only discern for themselves which of those entities are good and which are evil, but to eventually be able to overpower and defeat the evil entities, if they embrace and learn to utilize the mysterious forces and rules of our magical interdimensional reality. And this is what every piece of propaganda coming from Hollywood has been pushing our entire lives. And almost without exception, the evil entities, be they presented as spirits or demons or aliens or monsters or whatever, they always wear their evil on their sleeve. They're always just super obvious in their destructive intentions. Whereas the entities who want to teach us how to develop our powers to achieve our full potential are always the good guys, the helpers, the benevolent ones. I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, if in Stranger Things Season 3 or somewhere down the line they perhaps introduce some new creature, some new benevolent entity from somewhere on the other side perhaps some other dimension being threatened as well. I mean, if there's the upside down, maybe they'll come up with the inside out or the, I don't know. But maybe they'll have some entity that'll come and start to teach all the kids how to use their psychic powers and not just L. Who knows? But all in all, the strangest thing about Stranger Things isn't just the fact that it reflects so many topics and themes that are a part of real conspiracies involving secret government projects and interdimensional entities and the development of things like psychic powers and dimensional portals and all the rest. It's the fact that even the show, Stranger Things, is itself actually a part of that grand conspiracy. That quote ancient work, the Mystery Babylon Agenda far more than even most conspiracy researchers even realize. <laughs>